With newspapers and television channels convinced Mr. Modi is about to expand and reshuffle his cabinet, we ask, who is he likely to bring in? Who might he consider promoting? And are there some he might altogether drop? Beyond that, what impact would this have on the Prime Minister's control of his government and the policies it pursues? That's the second discussion tonight. But first, a set of developments that haven't got the attention they deserve, though they could be potentially very worrying. On two separate occasions in the last six weeks, a Chinese submarine has docked in Colombo. This is a clear breach of the 1987 India-Sri Lanka Treaty, but the Rajapaksa government has brushed aside India's protests. Against the backdrop of fast-expanding China-Sri Lanka relations on the economic and military front, we ask tonight, is the new beijing colombo axis emerging, and could it be a challenge or threat to New Delhi? And now joining me to discuss whether China-Sri Lanka relations are posing a challenge to India are two of India's former foreign secretaries in Delhi, Kamal Sibyl, and from Calcutta, Krishnan Srinivasan. Also joining me in a moment, a former secretary in the MEA, KC Singh, the well-known defense analyst, Commodore Uday Bhaskar, and the strategic affairs editor of the Business Standard, Ajesh Shukla. Kamal Sibyl, let's start with the fact that in the last six weeks, a Chinese submarine has twice called at Colombo port, along with a support ship, and no advance intimation was given to the Indian government, despite the fact the 1987 India-Sri Lanka Accord requires this. How worrying a situation is this? Well, potentially it's, it is worrying because this is part of the larger Chinese uh, strategy to uh, establish uh, port facilities for themselves for their ships, commercial ships, and eventually for their military uh, vessels uh, in key uh, uh, areas uh, in the Indian Ocean, and Sri Lanka being one of them, and Gwadar in Pakistan uh, being another, and they also have built some facilities in Seychelles. Now, without this kind of support, they cannot really have any credible presence in the Indian Ocean. So I have always suspected that they would begin by arguing that uh, this is purely commercial in content, and uh, they need to be able to protect the sea lanes of communication because a lot of their energy and trade flows go to the Indian Ocean, which is a very valid argument. But one always suspected that this was the first phase of the larger strategy of eventually uh, okay. being able to build uh, for themselves enough political relationship with key countries uh, to have them accept the visits, periodic visits of their naval ships. Let's this poses a serious uh, security challenge to us in the future. All right. Uh, and the Sri Lankan government is certainly pushing the envelope and not uh, really taking enough cognizance of our serious security concerns of which they are aware. Let's, let's come to the bigger, grander Chinese strategy that you think lies behind this a little later. Let's first concentrate on the specifics, Krishnan Srinivasan, of these two Chinese submarines docking at Colombo port. Now, the annex of the 1987 India-Sri Lanka Accord states, and I'm quoting, Trincomalee or any other ports in Sri Lanka will not be made available for military use by any country in a manner prejudicial to India's interests. In addition to that, in September, when the first Chinese submarine visited Colombo, our national security advisor, Ajit Doval, told the Sri Lankan Defense Secretary, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, that this was unacceptable to India. So what is the message from Colombo when the same thing happens a second time, literally within weeks of India giving this warning? Well, it is a matter of concern, I, I, I would agree, but I might uh, be at odds with the rest of your panel I wouldn't myself be totally agitated uh, about this. Firstly, I think th over the centuries, uh, Colum uh, uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka has been a port of call for uh, maritime vessels going east-west or west-east. Uh, this has been uh, their bread and butter, and I think that th it's not likely that they would switch that off quickly. Secondly, I would say that certainly China has a very big armament program. It has the biggest submarine building program in the world today and their submarine fleet is going to get into blue waters in the Indian Ocean whether we like it or not. We prob don't like it but this is going to be the, the fact of life. Um, as far as uh, uh, the vessels which you mentioned over the last couple of months uh, docking in Colombo, firstly I think that uh, after the 
first uh, vessel did dock at Colombo. The naval chief of Sri Lanka was in India, and I think that uh, he gave uh, many reassurances to us that uh, these would not be hostile actions. Okay. And at, uh, I'd like to just say also that uh, at this very time we're having a military exercise in, in Sri Lanka with the uh, Sri Lankan army. I wouldn't consider, frankly, that this is a totally hostile act. In regard to the uh, okay. uh, sections that you quoted of the 87 agreement, these are subject to interpretations. We could interpret these actions as not being prejudicial uh, to Indian security. So, I take your point. Uh, there could be a difference in interpretation here. I take your point. Uday Bhaskar, before I pursue the line I was taking with Kamal Sibur, let me pick up for a moment on what you've heard from Krishnan Srinivasan. The Sri Lankans claim that both submarines simply docked to replenish supplies. Shinoa, the Chinese news agency, says this is international common practice. So could it be the case, as you've heard Krishnan Srinivasan say, that India may be overreacting because of our own Chinese sensitivities? Or do you think that's not the case? I would go... Can I go ahead, Karan? Yes, go ahead, please. I would go along with the formulation that perhaps India should look at this in context, which is that submarines do call at ports, quote-unquote, where friendly countries allow this kind of an arrangement. And as far as China is concerned, yes, it is engaging into a more robust relationship with Sri Lanka. And I don't think India at this point can really take exception to what Sri Lanka has done though it may not be very comfortable or, shall we say, see this as the most desirable arrangement. Okay. So I think at this point I would see this as an issue that should be monitored, but I would not characterize this as quote-unquote a threat. But yes, the Sri Lankans are definitely, I think, pushing the envelope okay. as far as the bilateral with both India and Sri Lanka, China are concerned. If I understand correctly, you ally more with Krishnan Srinivasan than Kamal Sibyl. Now, Casey Singh, the first Chinese submarine stopped at Colombo just before President Mukherjee's visit to Vietnam, almost coinciding with President Xi's visit to Sri Lanka. The second submarine visited Colombo just after the Vietnamese Prime Minister had visited India. Do you believe that this coincidence is just a coincidence and nothing more? Or do you think the Vietnam connection I've sketched out is deliberate and that there is an intended message behind it? No, the timing, timing in international uh, relations is extremely important and particularly between countries like India and China, two competing powers in Asia. And the timing is deliberate. Uh, I don't take it as coincidence. Uh, but this is very clearly hedging which has been going on uh, for some time now and this is not new. In the 80s, Sri Lankans were hedging using the Americans. Uh, we were then uh, fearing a voice of America station. We were fearing print for money being given to the Americans. So Sri Lanka has tried hedging, except in 1987 we imposed something closest to a Monroe Doctrine when we had our troops there. Now with a thousand soldiers laying down their lives for the unity of Sri Lanka, what we are seeing today, what we are expecting from Sri Lanka, was certainly greater sensitivity uh, to Indian concerns, particularly when the side letter to the 87 agreement is very clear. So this is, this is as uh, uh, Uday said, the Sri Lankans are pushing the envelope. Of course, we will do the same thing probably with Vietnam. Uh, and we should be prepared for this kind of counter-reaction. But why Sri Lanka should play a game in this, I think that is something that Sri Lanka needs to think about. I just look at the Sri Lankan authorities claim that since 2010, 230 warships of various countries have called at Colombo port on goodwill visits for refueling, crew refreshment, crew replenishment. Whilst that may be true, from the Indian standpoint, the visit of a Chinese submarine twice in a six-week period is of course very significant. As a military strategist, what is the implied military threat that could be lurking behind this? Well, the first clear message that comes out of all of this is that Indian Ocean is now very much China's patch. Starting from 2008, when China started taking part in uh, the anti-patrol international mission off the Gulf of Aden, uh, Chinese 
task forces, actually 18 task forces to date, have transited through these waters, have operated in these waters, and the Chinese have used this anti-piracy mission as a way of familiarization with the Indian Ocean, as a way of showing presence in the Indian Ocean, and India is going to have to come to terms with it. Now, it is interesting that this first submarine that called on the 15th of September was, according to China's Defense Ministry, the first submarine ever to call on any port in the Indian Ocean, and they said the first to openly call on any port, so which suggests that maybe in a clandestine way others had called. But India needs to understand that it cannot expect other countries to just tell China that we are not going to allow your submarine to dock because India is sensitive to, uh, to submarines over here. China is going to have to share the Indian Ocean with the Indian Navy. The okay. Indian Navy will always be significantly more powerful than the Chinese Navy in the Indian Ocean. And we should be, rest we should be resting content with that. Councilman, but let's widen our discussion at this point. I'm told 60% of the equipment that the Chinese Air Force, sorry, I beg your pardon, the Sri Lankan Air Force and the Sri Lankan Army have is of Chinese origin. In addition, Humban Tota port and the new proposed South Container Terminal in Colombo are being built by the Chinese and they will be operated by a Chinese company for 35 years. Does this taken together suggest a growing and perhaps worrying Chinese military influence in Sri Lanka? You see, there are two things. One is that uh, uh, what is it that India can practically do uh, to prevent uh, uh, Sri Lanka and China to build up this uh, strong uh, relationship in terms of uh, Sri Lanka providing port facilities to Chinese military vessels. Now there clearly our options are uh, limited because we cannot uh, force Sri Lanka to do something which Sri Lanka politically wants to do in order to balance uh, India and China, a policy which they have pursued uh, for a long time. The other is, of course, the option which is always open to us to keep pressing the Sri Lankan government to take cognizance of our serious security concerns and behave uh, more responsibly and with greater wisdom in terms of its relationship uh, with India because they know what our concerns are. It's not okay. as if this is something which uh, we have just brought out into the open now. We have been talking to Sri Lanka about this for a, for a long time. But Sri Lanka feels it has the diplomatic maneuverability uh, in, uh, you know, currently to be able to stand up to Indian pressure. And China is investing very heavily. You know, Several billion dollars worth of absolutely. investment they are making. And you have rightly pointed out the, 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 the 35 years BOT uh, arrangement that they have for both these ports, including the Haman Tota Phase 2. Plus, they have uh, taken a huge amount of land, both as freehold and as uh, for 1999-year lease. Uh, in in in, uh, in, uh, in in the Colombo port, Absolutely. and interestingly, they have also signed an agreement. That this is interesting, important. Well, but, but, they have don't, signed don't, an don't agreement with the, the Sri Lankan the government to, to what look you're for is, to look the, for the remains of Zheng Zhe's yeah, well, uh, vessels, which may have sunk in this area, which means that they will then. Kapasimba, let's not get lost in the details they've signed. What you're saying is that all of these details actually do suggest a worrying military development. They will then Are you agreeing that these details suggest a worrying military development that India should take cognizance of? Or are you siding with Krishnan Srinivasan and saying, this is inevitable, we have to learn to live with it, we mustn't get over agitated? Which of the two are you saying? We seem to have lost Kamal Sibyl at that point. Oh dear, I think we've lost Kamal Sibyl. Let me go to Krishna this Srinivasan. This question is addressed to whom? Come, uh, I don't know what happened to that line, but I'll come back to Kamal Sibyl. We seem to have had a problem over there. Krishna Srinivasan, it's not just militarily that Chinese influence is growing. In fact, Chinese involvement in Sri Lankan infrastructure and their economy as a whole is huge. Between 2005 and 2012, China has given $4.7 billion of assistance, and the amount committed after 2012 is an additional $2.2 billion. Do you sense that slowly, steadily, and perhaps successfully, China is drawing Sri Lanka into its economic grip, something that would be, again, adverse to India's strategic interests? Well, you know, you've got to put this in a wider context. Uh, China is expanding its economic and political, even military uh, influence in very many parts of the world, not only in Sri Lanka, but we're discussing Sri Lanka at the moment. But uh, if you take uh, Myanmar, if you take Pakistan, if you take uh, 
uh, uh, countries even in Europe uh, or let alone Southeast Asia. I mean, this is a reality. And I think India has to not uh, try and create an exclusion zone. We can uh, make a protest to Myanmar today, Bangladesh tomorrow, Maldives the day after. No, but this isn't the right way to do it. Certainly we can express our concerns, but I think we have to look at this thing in a much broader picture and a, with a much wider strategy. We need to uh, ask the defense ministry, ministers of these countries in our immediate neighborhood perhaps to form a group where we can discuss these concerns uh, across the table and come to some kind of arrangements. And secondly, it is really important we don't have a hostile relationship with China. At least, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have a cooperative relationship with China okay. in many respects. We shouldn't transfer that into some kind of hostility. And we shouldn't encourage other countries to think that we have this adversarial relationship with China. Okay. This is a very short-term policy. We must think in a much broader context. Can I just take one moment to say uh, a window of a tremendous opportunity to my mind is opened up uh, between um, uh, for us with China in regard to Pakistan. I hope you'll give me a. a oh, one moment. This is not about India. This is not about China, Pakistan, or India, Pakistan. I'm sticking narrowly to China, Sri Lanka, India. So let's keep our focus on that for today, please. Uday Bhaskar, in contrast to what you've heard from Krishna Srinivasan, are some of the details that Kamal Sibyl was giving just before that line collapsed. Now, recently, China has signed a $1.4 billion agreement for the reclamation of 230 hectares of land from the sea in the Colombo area. 88 hectares will be given to a Chinese company on a 99-year lease. 20 hectares will be given to China freehold. Now, alongside China's control over Hub and Tota port, alongside its control over the South Container Terminal in Colombo, could this together pose some threat to the fact that 30% of India's transshipment cargo passes through Colombo? That's no longer a military danger to us. That could have enormous economic consequences if it materializes the way the threat suggests it could. Current, current 70%. I would characterize this as a case of China's growing influence as far as the Indian Peninsula is concerned. You have cited the details about Chinese investment in Sri Lanka. China is carrying out similar investments in other parts of the Indian Ocean littoral. So I think this is a development that India has to monitor. India has to respond to, but there is a King Canute element about this Karan, if I may say so, which is that Chinese economic and political presence in the Indian vicinity is going to increase. But if we talk about the submarine as a platform and what kind can, of can, a can I interrupt? it poses to India. Can I interrupt, Comrade Bhaskar? You see, the point I'm yeah. making is this. If Chinese control on port facilities in Sri Lanka and in the Colombo area in particular grows, then is there a threat being posed to the fact that 30% of all Indian transshipment cargo passes through Colombo? That's a very sizable potential impact on our economy. Should we worry about it or would you say, no, this is a fact of life, we have to learn to live with it? I would say it's a fact of life because Chinese management now is also evident in many other major ports of the world. So the fact that China has a management role in many parts of the major ports is a reality and it will become a threat if Indian cargo or Indian containers are deliberately treated okay. in a manner that would be deemed to be negative. That's Let the way I would characterize it. Casey Singh, I'm going Can to I go ahead the with discussion. the point about the nuclear submarine or not yet? Uh, I beg your pardon, what did you say? I said there was a point about the nuclear submarine that I wanted uh, to friend, add. It wasn't. I, I, let can me I correct do it you now there. or later? It was not a nuclear submarine. I've checked with the Indian High Commission in Colombo. Neither of the two submarines that came to Colombo were nuclear. In fact, the second submarine was a revisiting of the first. It was the same submarine that went twice. Nuclear was I know that. Karan, no, uh, let, me, let, Karan, me, let, me, let me let me move on because it Karan, wasn't I'm nuclear. I can of guarantee that, that you. Casey Singh, I want to widen the discussion one level further. China has strategic presence in Gwadar to India's left. 
it has strategic presence in on the Cocoa Islands to India's east. Now, it has an increasing proliferation of its presence in Sri Lanka along both the military and the economic and commercial lines we've sketched out. Together, realizing what used to be called the Chinese string of pearls. And before you answer, let me point out one other thing. President Raja Paksa strongly endorsed President Xi's theory of a new maritime Silk Road, which many believe could be the string of pearls under a new name. Look, we must make a distinction between, say, the Chinese presence in Gowadar and the Chinese presence, say, in Maldives, where also they've taken over the airport, and the Chinese presence in Sri Lanka. It's just 15, 14, 15 nautical miles separated from India. I think we have to start treating Sri Lanka Maldives as the first island chain for us, like the Chinese are treating their first island chain in the South China Sea, and accordingly build incentives and disincentives and deal with these countries from a position where we project power. Now you take one example, if Colombo is being developed as a container uh, transshipment center, then I'm very happy that the present government in Delhi is talking of opening a navigable channel through the Park Straits. Uh, so if we can balance the Ram Setu issue with a channel which we can open up that saves the sailing route by a hundred, you know, few hundred miles and that becomes a threat to Colombo as a viable port. So you have to deal with Colombo through new instruments of incentives and disincentives. Similarly, I believe Humban Tota was offered to us. We didn't go in at that stage. At one stage, Shrinkamali was offered to maybe Indian oil. So the lesson is when you get an opening, get your foot in the door. Okay. If you don't, someone else will or the Chinese will. I have no problem with the Chinese controlling a port because internationally, Dubai ports control a number of ports. International ownership varies. But for a submarine to come in is a signal which Sri Lanka should be sensitive about not sending to uh, New Delhi. And if they are sending it, then we need countervailing pressure to bring them closer to the side letter of 1987. Okay. As I said earlier, Indians have shed blood to keep that country united. Absolutely. You know, Ajay Shukla, we have a very interesting difference of opinion right across the panel today, whether we're talking about the visit of two Chinese submarines, whether we're talking about growing Chinese military influence in Sri Lanka, or whether we're talking about the economic hold that China has in terms of assistance that it gives Sri Lanka. We've got people who are worried by it. We've got others who believe this is something that is a fact of life that we need to live with. How does the Defense Ministry, how do our service chiefs view China's growing role and presence, not just in terms of the submarines, but militarily in Sri Lanka as a whole. Uh, Karan, the difference of opinion that you talked about uh, stems from one and one and only thing, and that is what does India perceive as insecurity? If we start seeing insecurity everywhere, if we start seeing one submarine docking at Colombo as insecure, as making India insecure, we are going to be feeling insecure all the time and that's going to have serious adverse implications on our whole strategy itself. The problem with strategists in India is that they, they, they sort of tabulate insecurities. Now let me just put to you one simple thing. A Chinese fleet in the Indian Ocean, I'm not talking about one odd submarine, I'm talking about a whole Chinese battle fleet in the Indian Ocean, would be knocked out of the water in no time at all. India has three air bases coming up in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Peninsula India can dominate the Indian Ocean with its Sukhoi 30 long range fighters. Any Chinese fleet in the Indian Ocean will simply be knocked out of the water. But we don't want to look at that. We want to instead look at one submarine docking in Sri Lanka and suddenly feel insecure. If we feel insecurity everywhere, we are going to be an insecure state. Okay. As far as the Defense Ministry is concerned, as far as the Indian Navy is concerned, there is a quiet confidence that we have the wherewithal, we have the ability to dominate the waters of the Indian Ocean. When China gets two or three aircraft carrier battle groups that will be able to come here and project Chinese air power, then they'll be in a position to stay. But right now, China can just send in the odd submarine, the odd anti-piracy patrol. It has no staying power in the Indian Ocean at all. 
I seem to have lost Kamal Sibyl. Maybe that line to Kamal Sibyl has simply completely collapsed. Krishna Srinivasan, let me put this to you. I know that you incline towards the view that we shouldn't overreact. I'm sure you share the view expressed by Ajay Shukla a moment ago that if we react insecurely, we'll be per perceived as an insecure nation and our reactions then will become those of a panic country. But there are many who believe that this growing Chinese influence in Sri Lanka has begun with President Rajapaksa. It goes back to 2005 when he first took office as president. Is there any truth to the belief that some have, I know you may not, that Rajapaksa is playing a deliberate strategy of playing China against India? It may be very much, from Sri Lanka's point of view, a sensible thing to do, but do you think that's what he's doing? Here again, this is a kind of... Uh uh, well, I entirely agree with Mr. Shukla. You're right. And uh, I, I hear again uh, the kind of proposition you've put forward is something we have uh, leveled against many countries in our neighborhood, uh, that they've been playing China against us, etc. I think every country looks to its own interest, uh, and ours uh, no less than anyone else's. I really think we need to have another look at our neighborhood, entire neighborhood policy. If it's a question of uh, Sri Lanka today, it may be a question of Bangladesh tomorrow. I think we need to uh, put our entire neighborhood policy into the right kind of perspective. We shouldn't get too uh, concerned about the stray visits of uh, individual submarines. We should have some confidence in our strength and we should work to restoring the kind of relationship that we had with Sri Lanka at one time before all these niggles started to okay. come up. And you know we haven't done Sri Lanka any great favors over the last 10 years ourselves. So I think that uh, we need to really have a look at this policy once more. You know, and you Bhaskar, cannot blame uh, a country. Comrade Bhaskar, we're taking a line of argument, I know that not everyone is in agreement with that line, but we're taking a line of argument that there's a sense in which Sri Lanka is snubbing or defying India and tilting towards China. But there is at least one instance where the Sri Lankan response to Indian military concerns and strategic concerns has been very different. When, for instance, India became aware that the Chinese were going to build an aircraft maintenance facility at Chinkomali for Sri Lankan Air Force's Chinese planes, we immediately protested and objected, and the Sri Lankans decided to relocate the facility. It now will not be built in Trincomalee. So, is it not the case that there are moments when, in fact, the Sri Lankans are responsive to our concerns, and those are moments when they believe it's a genuine concern? When we talk about submarines simply docking for replenishment, they take a very different view. And maybe on the submarines, we should say to ourselves, they have a right to have a submarine come and dock, but where it matters, like military facilities in Trincomalee, they're more responsive. Yeah, I think we should really look at the Sri Lankan facilitation in a more nuanced way. I agree with the observation that one Chinese conventional submarine docking in Colombo, even if it is twice within a period of six weeks, does not constitute, quote-unquote, a security threat to India. But in the event, over the long run, if Sri Lanka facilitates what you might call as, and this is where my nuclear submarine point is, the patrolling of Chinese nuclear boats, nuclear boats, SSNs, in the Indian Ocean, that in a way would have an adversarial impact on India's sovereignty. Okay. And I think India has to engage with Sri Lanka in a more persuasive manner so that they are not going to constantly play this card of India versus China and go back to the spirit of 1987, which is a certain empathy and sensitivity with India's concerns. Okay. And I think the reason we need to be very nuanced about this is that we do not want to have a binary choice vis-a-vis -vis China to say that any country that engages with Sri Lanka in our region would be deemed to be acting in a manner that is inimical to India. I think we then limit our own political diplomatic space. Okay. And if the spirit of what Prime Minister Modi said to Mr. Xi is to be realized, I think we have to look at these events in a far more nuanced way. Mr. Casey, let, 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 let me stop you there, Kamala Bhaskar. I'm running out of time. I'm stopping you there. I want to bring in Mr. Casey Singh to pick up on your last point, which is to do with how, in fact, India should respond. It is a fact that our national security advisor has, in fact, formally protested.